Global Summit, together with 38 UN sister agencies, ACM, XPRIZE, and co-convened with Switzerland. For today's session, we will be using the Q&A functionality to engage a discussion. You can find this at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, there is the chat functionality, which you can use to communicate with other participants. Please make sure to send your message to all panelists and attendees. And with that, it's now time for me to hand it over to the host of this series. Philip, how are you? Hello, thank you very much. Let me just quickly share my screen before we introduce the speaker. There we go. So welcome everyone to join the session of the AI for Good Discovery series on AI for climate science. And before we introduce today's speakers, I just want to briefly say a couple of words for how this series will run. So we had a nice opening session last week. And from now on, we will dig deep into the science really with weekly expert talks. And it starts today, but then we take a summer break and we resume again in September on Wednesdays. So there's a real opportunity to then look deeper into the issues of, at the interface of AI, machine learning and climate science. And so we have hope to have really good discussions. And I should say recordings of all talks are available. Obviously this doesn't work in everyone's time zone so well. So you can always look at the talks afterwards as well. But now coming to the real uh, main event. So I want to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Tapia Schneider, who's a professor of environmental science and engineering at Caltech, but is also a senior research scientist at NASA JPL. Tapia is an expert in the global circulation of the atmosphere and has done really extensive work on the evolution of the hydrological cycle under climate change and rainfall variability and the hydrological cycle in general. But most relevant for today's event series, TARP is also leading the Climate Modeling Alliance, which is an initiative with a mission to build the first Earth system model that automatically learns from diverse data sources to produce accurate uh, climate prediction. So TARP has received numerous prizes and fellowships, among, uh, among others, the James Holton Award of the American Geophysical Union. But today, we're very much looking forward to his talk on AI accelerated climate modeling. So without any further delays, over to you, TARP. Thank you, Philip. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you all for being here as well. Um, I should say from the outset, it's wonderful that we can have these online talks and all be together virtually in vastly different time zones. What's always hard is interaction. I, I do like when people ask questions even while I talk, so I'll try to monitor the Q&A as I speak. So if you have questions, feel free to chime in there. Okay, I will talk about AI accelerated climate modeling and the specific approach we're pursuing at the Climate Modeling Alliance. CLIMA is a, um, an alliance of about 70 climate scientists, applied mathematicians, data scientists, software engineers at Caltech, at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA, at MIT, and at the Naval Postgraduate School. And I'll talk specifically about how we go about building an Earth system model that uses the data we have about the Earth much more extensively than previous models. And I'll outline why this is not as straightforward as it might seem in the climate problem. There is a few specific challenges. Let's just start with the why here. Um, damages by climate related disasters exceeded $200 billion last year. They're increasing, they're steadily increasing. In fact, the damages are outrunning projections for the damages for the coming decades. And you all know what I'm talking about here. The upper left is a striking image of Germany just yesterday actually flooding there. We had heat waves in, in high latitudes. Um, Canada, for example, just in June. Wildfires last year in California, the bottom panel shows aerosols emitted by wildfires in California last September and so on. Um, of course, many of these extreme events have natural components to them, but they're exacerbated by climate change and the damages are exacerbated by climate change. It remains essential to mitigate climate change, that's without the question. But at this point, adapting to climate change likewise is unavoidable. And it has a large benefit cost ratio. Here's one example from a report two years ago from the Global Commission on Adaptation, where they tried to assess what the benefit cost ratio of various adaptation measures would be. What they come up with is that 
for every dollar you invest in climate adaptation now, you reap a benefit somewhere between $2 and $10 over a relatively short period, over a decade or so. And here's just some examples of these uh, adaptation measures one might take from strengthening early warning systems, for example, about flood risk, to making infrastructure resilient, again, resilient to floods, to heat and the like, uh, improving agricultural practices in, in dry lands, especially protecting mangroves, coastal protection, um, making water resource management more resilient. It's an issue, especially in California, where I'm sitting right now, that um, precipitation is becoming more variable. We have droughts, we have more extreme rainfall, and it creates challenges for water resource management. So, <clears throat> Investing in adaptation now has obvious and large benefits. The challenge is that we don't know with the accuracy we would like to have what we need to adapt to. Climate models have been very successful in predicting broad trends of global warming over the last few decades, um, but they're not accurate enough to give you the detailed and local information that we need for proactive adaptation. Uh, even global projections are rather uncertain and really too uncertain for large scale economic decisions. For example, global mean temperature. I'll show an example in a second. And local projections, projections of extremes, like extreme rainfalls are even more difficult and even more uncertain. Just one example, if you take the CMAP5, so just the previous generation of climate models, picture hasn't really changed in the latest generation, and ask the question, how much CO2 can we put into the atmosphere of these models before we have reached the two degree warming threshold of the Paris Agreement? So this is two degree warming above pre-industrial levels. Um, you get vastly different answers from these climate models. The answers vary between you reach two degrees warming above pre-industrial levels at 480 parts per million on the right here to almost 600 parts per million. We had a little over one degree warming so far, so it's really a question of how much more CO2 can we put into the atmosphere before we realize the remaining not quite a degree of warming. And climate models differ drastically in their answer to that question. We are at about 415, 420 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. So 480 parts per million is not far out. Translated into time, this is within the next 15 or 20 years. If the models on the right here are correct, you'll breach this 2 degree warming threshold in the next 15, 20 years or so. Well, if the models on the far left here are correct, then we would have a lot more time, even under a high emission scenario. This close to 600 parts per million will not be reached before 2060 or so. The models here are ordered in order of increasing climate sensitivity. So there's a general trend from higher critical CO2 concentration on the left to lower CO2 concentrations on the right. There are several reasons why there is a large spread in model predictions, but really one stands out as the primary source of uncertainty. And that one is the question of how low clouds respond to climate change. Um, the low clouds I'm talking about are, for example, the stratocumulus clouds over, in this case, the Pacific. I'm sitting somewhere around here right now. Um, they cover about 20% of tropical oceans, reflect sunlight back to space because they're white, as a result of which underneath them, the ocean is cooler. And low clouds are also cumulus clouds, as here around the Hawaiian Islands. They're more scattered. They expose more dark ocean surface because the area fraction they cover is much smaller as a result of which more sunlight is absorbed by the dark ocean surface, it's warmer underneath. And fundamentally, we don't know if we get more cumulus, less cumulus, more stratocumulus, less stratocumulus as the climate warms. Climate models produce wildly divergent answers here. They do not even agree on the sign of the cloud changes, much less on the magnitude. So if we, for example, would get more stratocumulus clouds covering a larger fraction of, of the tropical oceans as climate warms, we would get less warming simply because they are such an effective reflector of sunlight. If on the other hand, we lose some of the stratocumulus clouds, sorry, oops, sorry about that. If you lose some of the stratocumulus clouds, more dark ocean is exposed and we get more warming. So if you go back to this earlier bar graph showing these 29 models um, and their critical CO2 concentration for two degrees warming, the key difference between the models is that the models on the left will 
tend to produce more low clouds as the climate warms, whereas the models on the right tend to be, produce fewer low clouds as the climate warms. There are other important differences, for example, in, in ocean mixing and various other atmospheric processes, but the low clouds alone are the major source of uncertainty in predictions. So clouds and climate predictions are hard, and why are they hard? They're important simply because they play such a critical role in the in Earth energy balance through reflecting sunlight, through exerting a greenhouse effect. They're difficult, well, for various reasons, but maybe the simplest way of looking at it is that the turbulence and convection that sustains the clouds has small length scales. For the low clouds, the length scales of relevance here of order 10 meters or so down to meters in the vertical. And the typical climate model has a resolution of tens of kilometers on the, on the horizontal. Tens to 100 kilometers is still typical. So the clouds literally fall through the cracks of the computational mesh. What we do and what you need to do is represent the clouds in some semi-empirical fashion by relating variables that control cloud cover to what can be resolved on the computational mesh of the climate model. And this process is fraught and it doesn't work very well. Usually this is done in a fairly ad hoc way. There is little data going into these subgrid scale models. There's data used for evaluating them, but there's little data, observational data used to construct them. So they're not data driven in any, for any meaningful way. Just one example of what happens as a result. Here are again, climate models and colors and in solid black or observations. This is cloud cover off the coast of Peru in this particular case. You see cloud cover hovers around 70% year round. Various climate models, really all climate models produce too few low clouds. There is a severe low bias in the cloud cover as a result of which the ocean temperature underneath those clouds has a high bias. There are too few clouds, there's too much sunlight absorbed and the ocean temperature is, is too warm by up to a few degrees. In terms of energy fluxes, the biases can be tens of watts per meter squared. If you compare that with the signal we want to predict of global warming, which is a few watts per meter squared, these are really problematic and large. The bias is well known, I'm not saying anything new to the expert here. Um, it's so well known, it has a name, it's called the too few too bright bias. There are too few clouds, they're made artificially somewhat too bright to mitigate some of the energy flux biases. It leads to biases and rainfall um, in rainfall distributions in these models and various other models. So now you might ask, well, we know the equations of motions for clouds. It's Newton's laws, the laws of thermodynamics. Um, why can't we just compute what they will do? Before I started working in this area, I went through the exercise trying to figure out when will brute force high performance computing solve this problem? And the answer is not encouraging. Um, here is the peak performance of the world's fastest computers in gigaflops since 1979, the time of the first climate assessment, the Cherney report. And the <clears throat> AR1 through five marks the time of publication of various IPCC reports. And this is on a log scale. You see that the peak performance of computers has doubled roughly every 1.2 years. That in itself is really amazing. And the doubling has continued through the tradition from, um, from vector machines, for example, to massively parallel computing and the like. So that's great. We have had, had about a factor 10 to the eight um, increase in peak performance of computers since 1979. And can I ask, well, what has it done for the resolution of the atmosphere component of climate models? And the colored dots here are all atmosphere, atmosphere, ocean, or system models until 2017. And their horizontal resolution on the left axis, likewise on a log scale, you see the horizontal resolution has increased by about an order of magnitude in this period. So we are reaching this tens of kilometer horizontal resolution that I mentioned earlier. Now, the left and the right logarithmic axis are plotted in a specific way. They're plotted such that a factor 10 increase in resolution on the left corresponds exactly to factor 10 to the four increase in flops and performance on the right, because that's what you need for realizing an isotropic increase in resolution of a factor 10, you need 10 to the four times as many flops. And that is the rub here. If you extrapolate this out, say 
somewhat unrealistically assume Moore's law continues to hold, assume that peak performance continues to double every 1.2 years, we will be reaching what's called the deep convection gray zone where horizontal resolution of climate models reaches kilometer scales in the coming years. And that's great. It will make, for example, rainfall simulations more detailed. But as I said, these low clouds I talked about, they have scales of tens of meters. It's not even on this plot here. The low clouds are somewhere on the far right there. If you extrapolate it out, well, if exponential growth continues to hold, which is pretty questionable, you might be able to simulate low clouds globally by 2060. And that clearly is too late. The problem here is that to simulate these low clouds globally, you need to factor 10 to, 10 to 11 increase in peak performance of computers. And that's just not on the offing anytime soon. So brute force computing is not gonna solve this. And in some ways that's bad news. In some other ways it's good news. It, it just means the creativity of scientists is called for here to bridge a factor 10 to 11 problem. So clearly various types of machine learning methods have great potential to help here data and AI to the rescue, but climate is quite special and quite different from various other problems where we are using AI methods. So let me just outline um, a few challenges for climate projection. I see there's a question about quantum computers. It always comes up in that context. Yes, um, they're also too far out uh, away on the horizon and quantum computers as they're currently designed are not ideal for this problem, solving partial differential equations. So that's not gonna help us on a time scale of years in which we are need to make progress here. We don't have the luxury of waiting 20 years to solve this problem, I don't think. So what do you need for data informed climate models are three things that I think are crucial. We need generalizability. We need to predict the climate without an observed analog. We need to predict something we haven't seen. So we need models that generalize out of sample and generalize well. You want to use the models, for example, for climate adaptation decisions. <clears throat> and that requires trust. You need to be able to trust a model if you make economic decisions on the basis of it. If it takes a while, years to perhaps order decade before you are really knowing whether the prediction has been right. I think what this implies is that we need models that are glass boxes, not black boxes. They need to be interpretable. You need to be able beginning to end to understand what is going on in them. And what we also need for climate adaptation decisions is uncertainty quantification. So we need probabilities, we need risk estimates, and hence we need predictions with quantified uncertainties as we have in weather prediction, as we are all used to using in weather prediction and climate, we do not have quantified uncertainties in a meaningful sense yet, but we need it. Um, <clears throat> our approach here is in some ways the best of all worlds approach. We use what is best about reductionist science and combine it with what is best about what data science tools can offer to accelerate climate modeling. If you would go some deep learning route alone, say you built a purely data-driven model, there, there are numerous challenges to doing that. One simple one is just the vast number of degrees of freedom in the climate system. And while we have a lot of data, the, the data volume is still small relative to the number of degrees of freedom you would need to constrain. Um, the success of deep learning rests on overparameterization that gives you very expressive models that results in very data-hungry methods and it works extremely well in many examples, but it leads to challenges with generalizability, it leads to challenges with interpretability, and it makes uncertainty quantification hard. And these three, three things are crucial for the climate problem. By contrast, the success of reductionist science rests on parametric sparsity. Um, think of Newton's law of universal gravitation. It has one parameter, the gravitational constant, and with that, you can predict how an apple falls off a tree and the motion of planets around our sun and the motion of comets and motions of astronomical objects and other galaxies and the like. It's extremely generalizable. It, ex it generalized extremely well beyond the sample known to Newton. It's very interpretable. Um, however, 
pursuing this reductionist approach clearly has reached its limits in complex systems, such as the climate system. Say, a completely reductionist description of clouds would be wonderful. Many have tried, there has been decades of work on it, but success has been somewhat limited. So reductionist science reaches limits in complex systems. And what we are doing is combine both. Traditional reductionist science with data science tools, bare reductionism reaches its limits. So how does it actually work? Um, <clears throat> I think there are three ingredients here that, that are crucial and they're all, I would say equally important. You can't just bet on one at the expense of the others. You need to take the equations of notion, motion that we have as far as we can for example, through systematic coarse graining of the equations. Um, say the cloud problem, we know the equations governing them. We can coarse grain them, we get coarse grained equations, and I'll show you an example of them. What that gives you is a theoretical skeleton that ensures conservation of things like energy and mass that should be conserved. It promotes parametric sparsity. You use the equations as much as you can, reduce the number of parameters that in the end you need to fit to data. But again, it will reach limits, and where it reaches limits, you want to harness data. What we wanted to do, what we started out doing, is wanting to learn from Earth observations. We have a plethora of data from space, from the ground, from floats in the ocean, and the like. We want to learn from those data. Together with data, we generate computationally. See, there was a question in the chat. Um, we cannot <clears throat> simulate clouds globally. But what we can do, we can simulate them locally in limited areas. And I'll show you some examples of how we use that. So you can use local limited area simulations to generate data computationally. You need to be aware of the fact that this is not real data. It's uh, simulated data. It comes with shortcomings. There are still processes you need to represent empirically. For example, the microphysics of droplet formation. Um, but the dynamics of clouds you can simulate quite well, albeit only in limited areas. And computing, while it does in itself, it doesn't solve the problems here, it does provide a huge opportunity. On several fronts, there, there is a hardware revolution ongoing. So transition to hardware, heterogeneous hardware architecture with accelerators, GPUs, TPUs, and the like. It's much source of lament in the climate community because it requires a rewrite of models, but the rewrite is an opportunity. Um, you can rethink the structure of models and you can think about how you might exploit what the new computing architectures give us that we couldn't do before. And one thing you can do and what, for example, we are doing is um, exploit distributed computing on accelerators to run local simulations of small scale processes, such as those controlling clouds. You can do it in a distributed fashion. You can do many of these simulations simultaneously, thousands of them if you like, and thereby generate data through which an earth system model can, can learn. So in a uh, somewhat abstract picture, what we're doing is, is this. <clears throat> you take theory as far as you can go. Here is say the Navier-Stokes equation. There are some unclosed terms, say turbulent stresses in there in them. These turbulent stresses depend on resolved variables, a bunch of parameters through potentially complicated functions. And these functions are natural target for learning from data. The data we want to learn from are observational data, primarily from space because that provides just a huge volume of data, but really any kind of observational data from the ground, from floats in the ocean and the like. And simultaneously you can spin out simulations of processes that we can in principle compute, just cannot do it on the globe, such as low clouds. Here's some examples of low cloud simulations we have done, stratocumulus clouds, cumulus clouds, and the like. And you can spin out many of these simulations, thousands potentially simultaneously, while the global model runs. They generate data that augment the observational data. There are many things that are not easily observable, such as the turbulent characteristics within the cloud you can get them from simulations, from high resolution simulations, always aware of what the simulations can't do, such as um, simulating the microphysics of droplet formations, for example. So let me just give you an example of how that, how that actually works and um, I'll give you an example from clouds within the Klima project. There are many other examples, land modeling, for example, very similar approaches being pursued. <clears throat> 
So what we do to model clouds and the turbulence that underlies them is we start from the equations of motion. So it's Navier-Stokes equations, the laws of thermodynamics, and we conditionally average them, we coarse grain them. And the way we conditionally average them is by decompose the domain, the domain here say being a grid box of a climate model into one distinguished part we call the environment. And that is characterized by having fairly isotropic turbulence and coherent structures, updrafts, downdrafts, and the like. And there can be n of those. It can be an arbitrary number in principle, although there are limits uh, through what is computationally feasible. And if you course going the equations, you can do this exactly. You get the equations written out here. Um, there's, for example, a continuity equation with a density rho, and then there appears an area fraction AI, that is the area fraction of the subdomain I occupied within a grid box. And left-hand side, otherwise, to those who are familiar with it, it's just a standard conservation law for mass. But through the coarse graining, we are introducing additional terms. And the, what these terms represent are interactions between the subdomains. Say, so if you have an updraft in the environment, the updraft makes the cloud in the end, and the environment is what is around the cloud, you need to represent the interaction between the updrafts and the environment. So there are entrainment, detrainment terms appearing that represent that interaction. And while everything on the left-hand side are things we can resolve on the grid of a climate model, the things on the right-hand side, these functions epsilon and delta, entrainment, detrainment rates, a priori, we don't know what they are. So these are unknown closure functions. And these are great targets for learning from data. And similar unknown closure functions appear in various equations. So here is some scalar phi. It could be a energy variable, for example, potential temperature conservation law for that. There's a turbulent transport term appearing in it. You can go a step further, close that turbulent transport term. And we did that, say, diffusively and taking into account the transport by coherent structures. But re what remains are some unknown functions in these turbulent transport terms that you need to learn from data. So the key thing here is that the learning from data is restricted to the places where we know we cannot go further in pursuing theoretical approaches. The advantage of restricting the learning to those functions is that we are guaranteed a model that respects conservation laws, physical conservation laws. If you're careful about how these functions are specified, you can also ensure things like stability, which is quite crucial for actually using any such approach. Um, so these closure functions are our targets for learning from data for machine learning approaches. To be a bit more specific what they are, what we're doing here is in some ways what has been done in fluid dynamics for a hundred years since Prendel's times. So you just use dimensional reasoning and say, well, there's say an entrainment rate, it has units one over length. You can ask what variables do I have that have units one over length. One combination that has the right units is the buoyancy divided by the vertical velocity squared, B over W squared. So you can just model entrainment detrainment as B over W squared times some unknown functions of all non-dimensional groups that are left in this problem. Relative humidity is one of them. There are several others. So what you do is, in some ways, standard fair and fluid dynamics, you reduce the problem to learning functions of non-dimensional variables from data. And they appear in these exchange terms. They appear in pressure gradient terms. They appear in eddy diffusion mixing length. Um, it turned out here there is a lot one could do by theory as well. And I'll show you some examples in the end where actually theory got us very far in understanding how eddy diffusion and mixing work. It's a work by grad student Ignacio Lopez Gomez. Um, but there are always some parameters, at least, or parametric functions left that have to come from data. So let me just give you an example of how well that works so far. Here is one plot of a current climate model. It's, it's a French model, but it, there's nothing special about this model. What was just nice about the paper in which this figure appeared is that it clearly showed the biases in the low cloud cover in this model relative to observations. But it's very typical for climate models. Other climate models look very similar. And what you see here is a percentage bias in low cloud cover. Red means there is a low bias. So here you have these regions, for example, off the coast of California, or Peru, Chile, or Namibia, where you have extensive cover of stratocumulus clouds. And this climate models, as really pretty much all others, has a low bias in cloud cover here to 40, 50% or so. 
And you have large biases also in polar regions, for example, here over Greenland and various other regions, there's a high bias and a cloud cover there. It's just an example of typical biases. And you see these are biases over large areas. So the energy flux biases can be enormous and have an enormous impact on climate. Um, so here's just some examples giving you the previous plot just for orientation of how well our model here does in reproducing cloud cover and various other characteristics of the flow in various regions where climate models notoriously have difficulties. So for example, in the stratocumulus region, here is uh, the liquid water specific humidity. So the amount of liquid water in a cloud in a large eddy simulation in black, it's a high resolution simulation. And orange dots are observations from the DICOMS field campaign. The gray shading represents a range of other high resolution simulations. You see even in high resolution numerical simulations with millions of degrees of freedom, there's a wide variety of output they produce. This is a notoriously hard problem to simulate even numerically with high resolution models. And then the blue line is our prioritization, our reduced order model. So this model has, in this case, tens of degrees of freedom, 64, I believe in this case, compared with 2 million or so degrees of freedom in the black line. And it re reproduces the observations just as well as the high resolution numerical simulation. So this is a physically informed model. It has in the end nine parameters only that were calibrated against high resolution simulations. And it reproduces stratic cumulus cloud cover extremely well. It also reproduces stable polar boundary layers quite well. So here is um, the our two velocity components, uh, east-west and north-south, and in blue and then red in the stable boundary layer. And the solid line is again a large eddy simulation. Shading is a range of other large eddy simulations. And the various dotted and dashed lines are our reduced order one-dimensional model. And again, it reproduces these numerical simulations extremely well. It requires fairly high vertical resolution to do so, so in the range of tens of meters. But if you have that vertical resolution with tens of degrees of freedom, it reproduces this polar boundary layer extremely well. And again, it's the same model as, as in the stratocumulus top boundary layer, just with nine parameters, same nine parameters, nothing else is different. And you can go through um, shallow convection in, in the Caribbean, it's another example of the liquid water specific humidity. We can also reproduce well. This is not considered a terribly hard problem. Other models can do this too. Uh, what is a good bit harder problem is deep convection here over the Amazon. This is showing in the lower panel the vertical velocity in a high resolution simulation and um, below in the one dimensional model. And the crucial thing here is that this model captures the onset of um, strong vertical velocity, strong deep convection, and rain quite well. It's something else that climate models have had difficulties with for decades. So here is just one example of success with this approach is take theory seriously, and in the end, calibrate a few functions, a few parameters with data. And for these particular examples, as I said, it's just very few parameters that are being calibrated. We are, we are in the process of using more data and learning more complicated functions, but you can get quite far um, just with a few degrees of freedom. So <clears throat> we're pursuing similar approaches for modeling the land, the biosphere, and the like. And in the end, what we want is calibrate an entire Earth system model with data, observational data. And to do so, you need very fast algorithms for learning from data. It creates a few special challenges. Um, let me just answer one question in the chat. How do you test that a function you're using are physically realistic? So you know limits of the functions and you know that the limits they need to satisfy and limit of stable boundary layers or convective boundary layer. And you build that in from the outset that the functions you learn respect those limits. So in some ways, physical realism is built in before you even get started. And by focusing the learning on the part that's uncertain here, where really physics alone doesn't give you the answer, you are um, and doing it within the constraints of conservation laws at least you are guaranteed uh, respect of conservation laws, for example. So CLIMA is, is a group of about 70 scientists, applied mathematicians, software engineers, and we are pursuing the same approach for all com components of model newer system model. Um, at Caltech, we're working on the atmosphere together with JPL on the land, land biosphere, MIT is working on the ocean and the like. The approach in 
all these components is similar and that we want in the end a layer of data simulation machine learning tools wrapping around all components jointly and informing all components jointly with data from space from the ground and with data generated computationally by simulations that you spin out for the processes where you can do this ocean turbulence atmospheric turbulence and the like obviously say the land biosphere you don't have the luxury that you can simulate it in high resolution simulations in quite the same way so there you can do that so we want all components to learn jointly from data what we decided is the best approach here is to learn from statistics accumulated in time for example over seasons to calibrate model components jointly Statistics include mean fields. So if you calibrate mean fields, that means you minimize the mean model biases, say in top of atmosphere radiator fluxes. And they also include higher order statistics, such as precipitation extremes or covariances between surface temperature and cloud cover. Learning from statistics represents a great opportunity and it comes with challenges. It represents a great opportunity for, for several reasons. One is, Learning from statistics results in smoother objective functions, the matching trajectories, which is what you do in weather prediction, where you just try to, you minimize the mismatch between predicted and actually observed states of the atmosphere rather than statistics of it. Statistics are smoother, more smoothly varying in space and time. It makes for a nicer optimization problem. And statistics is what you care about in the climate problem. You want to predict statistics of a climate system, not you don't want to predict the weather on July 16th, 20. 35, but you want to predict statistics of what the weather might be in July 2035. So it focuses on what matters in, in the climate problem. It has other advantages. It solves a problem, for example, between mismatch between resolution of simulations and observations. It's an often stated challenge because the statistics vary smoothly in time. The resolution mismatch is basically a non-issue once you focus on statistics. It allows you to include things like covariances between cloud cover and temperature, what are known as emergent constraints directly in informing a model. And it allows you to include things like precipitation extremes, which is one of the things you want to be able to predict well in the loss function. But the challenge is evaluating the loss function becomes extremely expensive because each evaluation is requires the accumulation of statistics of the climate system. So you need to run the climate model for at least a season, several seasons typically, and you need to do this many times to optimize, to minimize the loss function. Um, and let me just frame the setting and then tell you what our solution to this problem is. So the setting is this, we have data and the data are time aggregate statistics, including higher moments of, of the data and the like. And we have a model G. That's your climate model that depends on parameters data or parametric or non-parametric functions. So G maps parameters to data. And because the statistics are aggregated in time, it is reasonable to assume that a central limit theorem holds. So the, the mapping here will be affected by noise eta. And it's reasonable to assume that this noise is Gaussian because we're looking at averages in time. Um, that assumes that systematic model errors are not included in this noise. I won't have time to talk much about systematic model errors. I'll mention it a little bit in the end how we deal with it. Basically, the systematic model errors we are including through error models inside this function G. So calibration and uncertainty quantification for theta are both important, but G is extremely expensive to evaluate. It's a climate model and our system model. And usually we have it only approximately available and derivatives of the model are usually not available. That's the setting and that's the challenges it generates. Um, here's our solution to dealing with this problem. It's an algorithm we call Calibrate Emulate Sample, CES, because calibration and emulation and sampling is what it does. So it's a three-stage process. In the first stage, we use ensemble methods, common inversion and variance thereof, to calibrate the parameters given the data. What this does is essentially solving a, an experimental design problem. The parameter vector is potentially high dimensional. So we have to sample well in a high dimensional parameter space to get good uncertainty quantification in the end. What this calibration step does is essentially generating input output pairs, parameter data pairs um, in a way that's quite effectively sampling 
near the optimum of the parameters. So what common inversion and its variants do for us is help you explore a high dimensional parameter space and putting training points in that high dimensional parameter space somewhere in the vicinity of an optimum of the parameters. What we get out of that, so you typically have an ensemble of size 100 or so, you typically need a few iterations, say five iterations. Um, in this calibration step, so you have 500 pairs between parameters and output parameter data pairs that then we use to train an emulator on the data. And this emulator can be any number of good emulators. I'll show you some examples with the Gaussian process. You could use neural networks here very well. This is an interpolation problem. It's really tailor-made for deep learning approaches. What we get is an emulator of the map from parameters to statistics. And that emulator is extremely cheap to evaluate. And then we can use the cheap, cheap emulator to sample from it, say with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to get a Bayesian posterior on the parameters. So what this chain does is concentrate the expensive step on this calibration procedure. This is requiring the evaluation of an expensive forward model. And you need to do this typically a few hundred times, even in high dimensional parameter spaces. And then the sampling usually is what's expensive. You need 10 to the five samples typically, but this is now done on a cheap emulator and the computational cost of the sampling step is essentially zero compared with the calibration step. So what you get out of it is a very fast Bayesian learning algorithm that gives you uncertainty quantification, um, essentially at the cost of what common inversion for calibration would cost you. You can include a number of things in this algorithm and be a, ha we have a series of papers and more coming showing the kinds of things you can do. You can include experimental design, answering a question is where do you want to put a high resolution simulation in a Gilbert model for it to be maximally informative. You can include that in a model. You can include learning of, a, uh, of stochastic models. You can include learning of, st of structural errors in, in this pipeline and the like. What you get is approximate Bayesian and posterior, so you get quantified uncertainties, including covariant structures of errors that after the fact you can use to analyze um, your physical model. Uh, you can use correlations between parameters, say in this turbulence convection schema that I told you, earlier, told you about earlier, to um, learn about how to improve the physics of the model. If they're correlated parameters, you can ask the question, how can you get to less correlate, correlated parameters, for example, on the basis of examining the posterior. Um, let me just show you a relatively simple proof of concept in a three-dimensional but very idealized climate model. It has a very simple convection scheme um, that essentially relaxes temperatures to moist adiabat on some time scale tau, and it relaxes moisture Q to a reference profile that is the moist adiabatic specific humidity multiplied by fixed relative humidity the scheme in essence has two parameters. This has a few more, but we'll focus on these two, this relaxation time scale and the relative humidity. It's a relatively simple convection scheme as was common in climate models um, 15 years ago or so. Um, at this point there, it's just a simple scheme. But let me illustrate how this works with a simple scheme. So here's just a perfect model scenario only. So we generate data from output from a model that we corrupt with some stochastic noise. We know what the two parameters were with which we ran the model, 70% relative humidity and two hours for this time scale tau marked by the cross between these dashed red lines. And we have an ensemble, initial ensemble of size 100 drawn from a prior. And you see there are 100 points here um, covering the space. Our loss function, our objective function has a few climate statistics that we think are relevant for learning these parameters. There's a relative humidity in the troposphere, there's a mean precipitation rate and there's an extreme precipitation rate in here. And this first calibration step uses common inversion and you'll see it's animating, this ensemble collapses to the vicinity of the true parameter value in about five iterations. So you have about 500 evaluations of this relatively simple climate model. <clears throat> then we emulate the loss function. So the mapping from parameters to loss function here. So loss function is relative humidity as a function of latitude in the metroposphere mean precipitation rate. And there's a measure of precipitation extremes or intense precipitation. What it is, is the probability of exceeding the 90th percentile of precipitation in the long control climate simulation at any given latitude. So the true value for this should be 
and in blue is the visible climate model and in the, the bars and whiskers are 95 percent confidence intervals coming from internal variability in the climate model and we use a gaussian process emulator which is shown in shading and where you see it captures the mean and the variability <clears throat> of the uh, terms in this loss functions very well so it gives you an effective emulation of the model statistics at essentially marginal computational cost there's a few tricks required to make this work you need to transform to uncorrelated data spaces and the like we have papers on that and um, look at the details there. Gaussian processes don't scale well to high dimensional spaces, so they're, it, it, it's natural to replace them with neural networks eventually, and we're in the process of doing that as well. So now we have a cheap emulator from which we can sample, and here is, after 500,000 MCMC iterations, the uh, posterior that results from sampling from this emulator. And so the blue shading is the posterior we get, the posterior density. <clears throat> and the black dots are just the common ensemble at the end of the iterations. And you see the common ensemble is fairly collapsed. The mode of the posterior is pretty much right at the correct values, two hours, 70%. The common ensemble is a little slightly displaced from that. But the crucial piece here is that the common ensemble is collapsed. It's not a good measure of uncertainty, the ensemble. And it, this is well known only in a linear case does the common ensemble give you a good estimate of uncertainty. This is a highly nonlinear problem and it's not giving good uncertainty estimates. This problem is simple enough that we can compute brute force uncertainty estimates. And what that gives us is that this blue shading is actually a good estimate. It's an accurate estimate of the parametric uncertainty in this model. Um, <clears throat> If you want climate predictions with quantified uncertainties, again, in this pretty simple setting, you can prove the concept that it can be done. What you do is you draw from the posterior density, you draw an ensemble um, of plausible parameters, parametric functions, and the like, and just integrate that forward. And from that ensemble, you can get uncertainty quantification and predictions. So here's one example. We just predict um, the probability of exceeding a 99.9th percentile of the control precipitation control presentation at a control climate in a warmer climate. So we do some global warming here, idealized global warming, and ask how much more likely is it to exceed what is a 0.1% event in a control climate in the warmer climate. And you see that probability ex increases quite dramatically, which is part of why we see the flooding we are seeing in Europe right now. The probability of extreme precipitation is increasing rapidly in warming climates. We know that. and. <clears throat> what is new here is that we can quantify the uncertainties in these predictions in this relatively simple model. So the orange shading gives you the quantified uncertainties. They're relatively small, mid-latitudes, and they're very large in the tropics, which is something we also know from decades of work on extreme precipitation, that tropical precipitation is hard. Preservation extremes are much harder to predict than extratropical precipitation extremes. And you see this explicitly here. You can include learning about structural model error in, in the same framework. There are papers on that you can find on the Klima web page. There's one archive preprint. There's a few important lessons we learned for how to do this and how to do it well. One is that you really need to learn sparsely. In some ways, you don't want to do harm by including error models just because you can, that there's some error model possible because it lies in the null space of the data. Um, so L1 regularization is crucial for learning model errors. Don't have time to talk about this now just to say you can include all of that in in this pipeline you include in, you can include things like dictionary learning that you learn from a dictionary of differential equation terms uh, structural model errors and the like so we're pursuing the same approach for all components of this all new earth system model what we want is build a model that learns automatically from observations and high resolution simulations for your observational data alone don't give you all the information you might want to have we want to achieve the improved simulations first of the present climate that we have some confidence that the model is good. For example, improved rainfall distributions, low local rainfall extremes, and then provide predictions with uncertainty quantification, including structural error uncertainty quantification based on observations and high resolution simulations. Um, it will be another two years or so before we are there that we have a fuller system model that can do this. Eventually, what we hope to provide is a platform for climate information that you can hook into to get the information you need, whatever that is, whatever 
your specific area of interest is to plan a resilient future. So in some ways we are viewing what we're doing here as the back end, a climate modeling back end of a platform that can anchor an ecosystem of front end apps that give you the detailed information that you need in whatever your specific area of interest is. This will be very different from community to community. The needs of a municipal planner and architect are very different from someone planning resilient development in the developing world and needing to know about crop yields. The idea is that we provide a platform where you can get whatever information it is that you need about crop yields or extreme precipitation or energy demand of buildings, whether for the future, if you wish, and feed that into an ecosystem of apps that translate background information, climate information into information people can and want to use in making practical decisions. This is, you can think of a long pipeline here from data to end user information and our current work is bridging the gap from data to the model and there is a large gap. And then there's the other large gap from climate model output to what people actually need to make informed decisions. And we hope in time also to be able to bridge that gap, not us alone, but in collaboration with various stakeholders. And we're beginning to explore collaborations, for example, with architects um, who want to plan cities or, or occupancy comfort and buildings in, in, in a warming climate. So a few points to conclude. I think it's urgent to reduce and quantify uncertainties in climate models is extremely urgent. This is really not a task that can wait many years even, but it's, it's really something we'll need to achieve within a few years. The socioeconomic benefit of achieving this has been quantified by economists. The, the numbers people come up with lie in the trillions of dollars, US dollars in savings just by reducing uncertainties by a factor of two on a time scale of a decade. Uh, this can't take long because eventually we'll know how climate change is. So you need to have pro information to plan proactively and hence you need it soon. Achieving this is within reach. Um, our approach to achieve it is to combine process informed models with data driven approaches, harnessing climate statistics. I just showed you one example. I, I've been somewhat flabbergasted myself how well it works in other areas as well. For example, in, in land modeling, um, there's a lot we know about the biophysics of plants, their hydraulics, how they photosynthesize. And if you combine what we know there with data-driven approaches, it's really striking how, how much progress can be achieved in models that remain parametrically sparse, which again is crucial for them to be generalizable and interpretable and things we can trust in the end. I showed you a sparsely parameterized physics-based model for clouds and turbulence. It captures um, climate different dynamical regimes that have vexed climate models for decades. There's a question in chat, why did I show you uh, comparisons with simulations? The, there were some data in some of the plots. The challenge is we don't have detailed data um, to compare these point-wise simulations with the best we can do there and the most controlled we can do is generate the data computationally. But we do want to get to the point that we can compare with actual data and learn from actual data. Just in order to do that, you need to have all of that integrated in our system model. And that's what we are working on, integrating the various components into a climate model that then can actually learn from data. So the model in the end will learn from observations and we are not quite there that we can do this for a whole model jointly, but this is a matter of, I hope, months before we can start doing that. And where you, where you have them, you can also learn from high resolution simulations that can spin off on the fly. And what I showed you was learning from high resolution simulations so far. <clears throat> this Calibrate Emulate Sample Framework is the core of our data simulation machine learning layer. It gives you about a factor thousand speed up relative to traditional Bayesian learning methods. A factor thousand here comes from the fact that the traditional methods, MCMC, require 10 to the 5 evaluations of a climate model, and we get away with 10 to the 2 or so. And the, because the emulation is so fast. So this is one really good use of AI methods to accelerate, drastically accelerate a crucial step in learning from data. And a lot of work remains to be done. Our project is open source open development, pretty much open everything. We are very interested and eager in collaborating with others. Um, it, it's really a problem for humanity to come up with better climate predictions. And I think the more we work together and the more effectively we work together as a global community, the, the better chances that we can solve it. 
there's a lot of work to be done from uh, on the theory side, course granting for various types of systems, on the software engineering, computational side, uh, scaling on HVC architectures, on the learning side, how to optimally target high resolution simulations and so on and so on. There's really no shortage of, of work that still remains to be done. Um, I should thank our funders, Eric and Wendy Schmidt, our, our main funders through uh, Schmidt Futures. And there have been a number of other foundations who have been crucial in getting us started and continuing to fund us, the Heising Simons Foundation, the US National Science Foundation is supporting our work with, uh, as a software institute. And uh, Ron and Maxine Lynn provided funds as that uh, Charlie Trimble has been a supporter of this from the outset. I'll stop here and be happy to answer more questions and look through the, uh, the uh, chat. Thank you, Tapio. A fantastic talk, really inspiring, really good way to kick off this part of the series because you covered a lot of lot of ground. So that's great. There's lots of questions in the chat and I'm quite happy uh, for you to pick one, but maybe I'll take one out from the chat, not the Q&A because of a similar one I had myself, a bit out of training data. So how confident are we with, with uh, learning parameters uh, as the climate shifts and could we be out of training data? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really the crux of the problem here, right? That we need to predict something where we actually don't have training data. So again, for us, the way to deal with it is don't overfit, be as sparse as you can. That is in itself no guarantee, it helps. I think what you need to do to gain trust in the model is look for short-term prediction targets where you can be right or wrong on reasonably short time scales. Weather would be ideal. I mean. What I would hope we can do one day is use this model for weather forecasting and whether you're right or wrong every day. And it's really a great test of climate models. The UK has been fantastic there in, in integrating weather and climate modeling and have been very successful because of it. And that's definitely one good way. There are other prediction targets like the response of the climate system to El Nino, um, so it gives you time scales of months. I think those prediction targets we have to exploit to see how, how well we do and to build confidence that in fact the model is good. But you know there, there won't be any strict guarantee until in some ways it's too late, right? Great. I mean, there's maybe a question we can pick from <coughs> Oliver Meeling, uh, who, who speaks about general uh, generalizability, in particular also the question um, that if you mostly train from satellites, is this enough of a constraint or would you have to bring in other more process-based <coughs> data sets, yeah. I would think? Good question. So again, generalizability for us comes from taking the processes extremely seriously, and that makes the work a bit harder. You just don't take, say, a random forest. You just don't just use PyTorch in a random forest and, and, and run something. There's just a lot of theory work going into it. it. makes it a bit slower. And I think that really is the crux, though, to be care careful there. Then, of course, the question remains, and, and is a good one, the data we have are just for the present climate. And well, why don't we use other climates? Large glacial maximum, past climates, right? That was a question. I think ideally you would. The data just are so sparse for past climates that it's hard to use them as a constraint. So what I would say is our goal here is to use the satellite era, the last 30 years for training the model. And the seasonal cycle is really a great opportunity that's that's underexplored and that it is a large signal in the climate system that you can exploit and this doing well in the seasonal cycle in many areas we, we know will correlate with better climate predictions. So use the last 30 years, focus on things like the seasonal cycle, and then you use that model to simulate the 20th century and the last glacial maximum and say the Eocene, if you like, and see how well you do and compare it with the sparse data we have. Directly learning from those sparse data, there's probably not enough information to do this well right now, but you can use it as a good test for the model in the end you have an out of sample test. Great. Um, there's an interesting question also uh, by Chinmay Advaryu uh, is, are there ways for startups and the private sector to collaborate? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the <clears throat> it's actually a really interesting question. I think it will be interesting to see what happens to climate modeling broadly in the coming years, right? The climate modeling has been housed in government-like labs, government labs, and I think it has been quite successful, but you are 
this is the defining scientific challenge of our generation. The brightest young people want to work in this area, right? And I mean, it's really amazing to see how fantastic applicants we get in, in, in grad schools across the world. I think it will be the same for you, Philip, right? Now, you want to capitalize on that. And it's hard to capitalize on that in, say, a government lab. It's not impossible, but it's hard. So universities, I think, help. But then to make this sustainable, it's hard to do at universities. You need stable infrastructure for computing. You need stable infrastructure for software engineers. All of that is notoriously difficult at universities. And I think there is great potential for startups and for the private sector to collaborate. I mean, there is a there is a start, large business need now for climate information. A lot of companies springing up trying to satisfy that need, mostly by sticking some black box in front of existing climate models. What you want is transparency, what you want is something that starts from a better model, but I think then there is there is potential for the private sector to get involved. Great. I'm also quite happy to have you for you to pick as you like, but um, otherwise I'll th keep throwing questions at you. Why don't you? I don't have a, I only see a few of them and... Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a question by Sonia Yusfi is if merging physics and ML is more meaningful for short term or long term uh, prediction. Um, I think it's more important for the long term because of this out of sample generalizability problem for the short term. I mean, it still helps and it's how we have gone about developing weather forecasting models for decades. Uh, there is less of an imperative to use physics and fort models simply because you can probably be quite successful interpolating with deep learning methods. Yeah, I'll maybe one question for myself and, and you focus for obvious reasons a bit on the learning of the model parameters and within sort of a, a given structure, but obviously that still leaves a structural representation and structural errors, which you mentioned you, you try to handle in certain ways, but you probably thought about it yourself, but could one learn also more about the model structure itself by some of these approaches? And this is something you've considered. Yeah, we are, we are, we are, we are trying and well, right now in just dynamical sim system prototypes, we haven't really done this in anything real and big. And I mean, there, there is wonderful work on say, learning from dictionaries of differential equation terms, learning the structure of, of models. and. We, we, are, we have tried doing that and we have done this successfully in dynamical systems. Jin Long Wu has some preprints on this <coughs> where um, use the same approach, learn from statistics rather than from trajectories. I mean, people have done this previously, they learn from trajectories and you can learn and you need to enforce sparsity, but then you can learn model structures as well. I'm not sure how well this will work, say for a convection prioritization in the end, because it's the space in which a structure lives is so high dimensional that you probably need to take your physics a good bit along the way to reduce the size of that space. No, that's great. I think this is probably a good time to wrap it up now and, and thank Tapio again for a really great talk. If you have time, Tapio, and want to type a few more answers in the, in the Q and A would be fantastic, but, but you might be constrained. Um, but thanks everyone for joining. We had a really great uh, number of participants and many people will watch uh, later on uh, the recordings. So as we said before, the recordings are there. Uh, you can go on the YouTube channel and now you can all take a good summer break. And I hope to see all of you again in September when we resume the series. So I hand over to Bastian here and thank Tapio again. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. And a big thanks also to Tapio Schneider for today's presentation. Um, so as Philip said, we, uh, we are taking a break for the summer and we will be back in September. In the meantime, there is a lot of material that you can find on our website and on the YouTube channel, um, aiforgood.itu.int. We're pasting the links in the chat. And so um, please have a look. Uh, there's a lot of things that you might find of interest. Uh, with that, I think we've reached the end of today's webinar. And I would once again like to thank everybody. So Philip, our host of the series, Tapio, our speaker for today. Uh, our sponsors, um, partners, and co-convener Switzerland, and uh, hope to see you all. Uh, and for in the meantime, we're launching a short poll. Um, please let us know if you enjoyed the webinar. Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. Um, and 
thank you everybody for your participation today. Uh, hope to see you all in uh, a couple of weeks. Enjoyed the webinar. Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. Um, and thank you everybody for your participation today. Uh, hope to see you all in uh, a couple of weeks. Enjoyed the webinar. Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. Um, Rewind selector. Rewind selector. And thank you everybody for your participation today. I uh, hope to see you all in uh, a couple of weeks. Enjoyed the webinar. Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. Um,